Okay, so now we're at the last section of the chapter on civil rights, and I know it's been a long few, few weeks, but it's a necessary few weeks, and um, I hope you understand and get why I spend so much time here. Um, we have to come to a point where we start to recognize and appreciate each other, even if we see ourselves individually or as a group and through a different lens, that we are weaker when we do not find our common ground to stand on. And uh, that we are, there really is nothing along that line that should separate us from protecting ourselves um, as a groups of people under the civil rights umbrella, which again is an umbrella for all people, not just one group of people or one gender or based on sexual orientation. So the, the last uh, portion here focuses on the rights of uh, women and also will be focused on the LGBTQ rights here uh, shortly. But the women's movement is an interesting movement because there have historically, since the, since the country was founded, been women who have worked vehemently to try to sustain the rights of women. And a lot of the, the impediment to that has been basically was based on the Bible. Uh, religion has, you know, people will interpret the Bible to say women were supposed to be a help to man or his assistant, basically. So women have relegated to uh, second class citizenry, just one step above slaves. And it's ironic um, when you go back to July 4, 1776. The only people who were really free that day were basically wealthier white men. Um, poor whites were still dispossessed. Um, and also women. And women were still property of their men. Uh, and uh, you know, blacks were slaves. So there really wasn't a whole lot of people who were free on that day uh, that we hold as Independence Day because the country was independent, but the individuals in the country certainly were not. Uh, and so it takes, you know, another, eh, you know, basically about 70 years uh, for women to come together at Seneca Falls in 1848, uh, Seneca Falls, New York. I think it's New York. Yeah, New York. Um, and they have a convention to discuss uh, the rights of women. And uh, so this battle goes on uh, throughout the 19th and the early 20th century. And it's interesting because part of the women's suffragist movement was the succeeding and beginning of the abolitionist movement that helped do away with slavery. And ironically, although black men, and it was only black men, women still were not given the right to vote even after the Civil War amendments uh, that granted them the right to do so, women still did not have the right to vote and not even white women. And so the white women who had supported uh, the abolitionist movement who thought they were going to walk through the door with the African-American men did not have that reality. And so there was a lot of bitterness and a lot of them started siding with the racist uh, women from the South and uh, started dividing themselves and started undermining the cause of blacks, black men particularly. And uh, with Frederick Douglass, who was a preeminent uh, uh, believer of the civil rights of, of individuals in the 19th century, he had, you know, really tried to tell the white women, hey, you know, I, I know it's unfair, but if you get, you know, once we get in and we can get our place, we will open the door for you. But then Rutherford B. Hayes came in and, and basically screwed all the people in the South, all the blacks in the South, and by taking away the Union troops and leaving them unprotected. Uh, so this battle, which starts in 1848, culminates basically, you're talking almost another 70 years later in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Ironically, though, it only gave them the right to vote and it did not grant them uh, anything else beyond that. Um, in fact, it's interesting to note that the Equal Rights Amendment, which has never been ratified in this country, sadly to say, uh, uh, would have prevented women from being discriminated against in workplace and other aspects of life. But it's never been a, it's never been a ratified by 38 necessary states. So it's an ongoing battle to even have an equal rights amendment that says that everybody has to be treated equally. <laughs> uh, you would think that'd be hard to believe in the 21st century, but we still have not been down this road since 
uh, the early 70s, which is the last time it came to uh, discussion. Um, I also want to point out some of the famous people, and you'll see them in the, in the next sec section here, the people who are who are so prevalent in trying to give, move the bar forward for women, particularly from between 1848 and 1920. There are many people, Lucretia Mott, uh, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, there were tons of people who, you know, Ida B. Wells. There are people who were actively involved in this movement who I guarantee most women have no clue about these individuals. And then the question is, well, why don't you know? You know why don't you know about these people? Why don't you know about Alice Paul or Lucy Burns or, or even moving into the modern movement, uh, people like Gloria Steinem? How many of you have ever heard of Gloria Steinem? Or, the, or, the, or now, NOW, the National Organization of Women, or even the Latina Women Organizations. Do you realize there are hundreds of organizations out there for women to help protect the rights of women and to help you? And most women have no clue about the, the organizations that are there to support them. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the, I, what, there was a movie that came out a couple of years ago, which I, if, if you haven't seen, I highly encourage you to watch on your own. And it's called Hidden Figures. And it was about three women who happened to be African-American who were prolific in, in helping to advance the space race in the United States in the early 1960s. And these are three brilliant women. And uh, they were, I mean, literally responsible for, for a lot of the mathematical equations and engineering to help get, to help move the race forward and help get John Glenn and Alan Shepard and those who were involved in the early space race back, back to Earth. <laughs> um, at the same time, they couldn't use the bathroom in the building where they worked. Um, and it's ironic. I mean, after watching the movie, I was so proud of them as women, but also as black women, I got both, right? But I found myself getting angry, and I'll tell you why I got angry. I got angry because <laughs> I kept looking at it going, why am I just learning about this 60 years after it happened? Why is it that these women were written out of history for 60 years? And you should ask yourself that same question about whatever group you come from. The, think about American history and how we teach our history. It's basically taught from a very sort of white Eurocentric hit version of, of history. They throw Martin Luther King at you, they'll throw Cesar Chavez at you, they'll throw a few folks at you, but most of the people you have no clue about. And let me suggest to you that it's done purposely, that the people they've left out of history, you know, are, are done so purposely. There are prolific individuals across all the groups of, that have made America what it is today. And it's ironic that what makes us potentially a good country, I don't believe in the notion of greatness, but good, potentially good, is our diversity. And yet it's also our greatest weakness. And so when you go back and if you were to do your own homework and do a little studying, you would see just how many things, the various groups, whether it be women or blacks or Hispanics or Asians or all groups have brought to this country to make it what it is and not just one group. And then ask the question, well, why are these people left out? Why do you not know about Alice Paul? Why do you not know about Gloria Steinem? Why do you not know about Ida B. Wells? Do you know that the first, the first female millionaire in America, first one ever, was a black woman in the early 20th century. <laughs> and she was the first person, uh, first woman to ever to be an independent millionaire in America. She did hair products for black folks. Um, and so consequently, you know, these are just things that, you know, when you think about little kids growing up, who can they look at people they want to emulate, right? With the little boys used to want to be police officers, firemen, doctors, lawyers, whatever, right? And then the same thing with for, for women though. If you don't if you don't present some people for who look like them to who have done prolific things, then they have to learn on their own what things they want to value and what they want to be in their future. But perhaps if they gave you a, a guidepost of people who have done those things, maybe growing up you would have said, Hey, I really want to do that, or maybe I can do that too, because Somebody who looks like me uh, and my, my, or my gender or my sexual orientation did this, so therefore I can do it. So we have to be conscious of the fact of the discriminations that have been put in place, institutionalized by how we have allowed our history to be taught to us and dictated to us throughout history. And I would say that I think I believe very strongly that the failure of addressing American history to make it a much more multicultural history, which is the truth of our history, is one of the greatest failings. Uh, for our, in our education system for teaching all of you uh, the history of our country and of the world.
Um, okay, so with that, um, I have some video clips I want you to watch. Uh, the first one here again is they're both of them have to do on this, on this this particular page with women's suffrage. So I want you to stop here, take a look at the two clips, and then we'll come back and then again um, we'll talk about it briefly and then we'll move on to the next clip. Okay. Okay. So I hope that you see from these two videos. Uh, just how what women had, what they had to endure to fight for their rights, uh, to be able to be recognized. And I wonder what they would think of the women today uh, in, in terms of their, your ability as females to, be, to have upheld and protected your rights as a woman in this society. I wonder what they would think of you today. And uh, that's something I'd like you to ponder for a moment. Uh, because for those of you who are trying to find, figure out, as you know, at 17, 18, 19, you're maybe trying to figure out what it is you want to do. And even if you don't have an answer to the question, doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you know, strive for excellence in whatever you're doing to prepare for whatever your career is going to be as you start to figure out that role. But recognize that so many people gave up so much so you could sit in the seats you sit in today and have the opportunities that you have today and that you'll want your children to have one day. Um, and so please be aware of that as you think about and consider uh, what, how much effort you put into the work of, of what you do being in college. Okay, let me move on here. Hey, what's up, everyone? Okay, stop that. Hey, Pazis. Very comfortably in the class by now. First of all, hey, this is, lucky. This is what we have public service, public service announcements for. Okay. <laughs> Hey, this is all organic, man. I'm not, this is all natural. So we'll just keep doing as we're doing. Uh, so this is again, another video that talks about the modern women's movement, because here's what happens after they got, uh, after women got the right to vote, um, in 1920, it was another 50 years before they really moved the bar forward. Like men were basically like, okay, Missy, we gave you the right to vote. Now leave us alone. And because of, of course, the, the economic collapse of the, 20, uh, the you know, 1929 stock market, uh, world wars, all these things took place that pushed women's issues off to the side for a big portion of the 20th century. So it wasn't until the 1960s and 70s with the civil rights movement that we start to see the bar move ahead. And I think it was even in some ways a bigger change than it would happen in the early 20th century. Uh, Women at the time from 1920 to 1950 were still home and homemakers and men held the jobs and, you know, because there was no equal protection under the law for against women being discriminated for jobs. So men held most of the jobs. By this movement, though, it really was a catalyst for for a change that was going to be forever. And at the time, we started to see things like for, for the divorce rate went straight to the roof because women for the first time were like, uh, no, honey, I'm not going to sit home and be barefoot and pregnant. I'm going to go out and get a job and work if I want to. And if I don't, if I choose to be home, then I'm, that's fine. But if I don't want to be home, that's fine, too. And it was a very powerful moment and a very challenging moment for a lot of uh, a lot of men in our society because they just didn't understand uh, what it is that that uh, women were asking and they thought it was, you know, they had a hard time m making a change when uh, change was coming and it was going to change forever. And uh, this is the days of when Gloria Steinem starts along with, the, uh, with her movement. She's still an iconic badass today. She's in her 80s and she's still just a tremendous, tremendous fighter for women's rights. And I'll tell you, when I, in my classes, whenever I talk about these issues and I find that so many women have no clue about the organizations that are there to protect them. It's kind of sad. It's like you have, you know, maybe maybe we foolishly just like under the civil rights movement think that we moved the bar so far that everybody plays equal. But the truth is it's not equal. In fact, women still statistically on professional jobs make 75 approximately 75% of what a man makes on the job. So that means we have a long ways to go to make some change. And uh, that requires us to, to sort of reflect and do what we need to do uh, on that end. So here again, I want you to take a look at this clip and uh, th then we'll move on uh, to the next part of this chapter as we wind it down. And the last part of this uh, we get to is on the LGBTQ community and uh, we'll be discussing that in just a second. 
Okay, so the last segment here uh, of this particular section focuses on the LGBTQ community, which stands for lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, and transgender, uh, queer, and uh, is a, again, a movement that started uh, in the 1960s during part of the civil rights movement. Um, and then it's had various iterations uh, throughout time. Most of the, the movement is interesting to note that this isn't a, it's, you know, the, this uh, uh, classification is not, excuse the plane. Perfect timing, right? This classification uh, is not a new classification in all in all honesty. In fact, it's been for thousands of years uh, where people have uh, questioned, sex, or not questioned, but have lived uh, with their sexual preferences. It's interesting how it's always based on, in America, we tend to define it by sexuality. Not, and so there's always this ignorance of it being a perverse thing and not a human thing that human beings interact with one another. It's always uh, kind of delineated in a very sleazy sort of way, which is unfortunate and ignorant because that's not at all the case uh, for those who, who live their lives in this way. And, you know, it's always like I say regarding civil rights, the rights, understanding the rights of individuals and respecting those who may be different from you or see the world differently from you uh, doesn't mean that we shouldn't respect the rights of those individuals who see the world through a different lens. Um, especially, you know, as we, we cannot ask those to respect our rights if we're not willing to respect the rights of those who see it in a different fashion. Um, but uh, thankfully, in the last 20 years, there has moved movement uh, for this community uh, on a lot of different issues. Uh, there have been Supreme Court uh, cases that have come to, that have been uh, that have uh, benefited the LGBTQ community. Uh, but we also have to be able to confront the ugliness and discrimination against against this group of people in our society. So I have three videos here uh, that I would like you to take a look at. And they're short clips um, about uh, about this issue. And, you know, when you see it, one of the things that I find interesting, and this is one of the unfortunate parts about, you know, how we confront ourselves and our own, you know, and what I would call the bias of religion Um you know, we have this notion of, of ideology based on what, how people perceive marriage and, you know, people who will say they don't like it because it's supposed to be the marriage means you know, between a man and a woman and all these types of things. And I'm always like, well, if that were the case, then why is your marriage not legalized until you go down to the court and have and sign papers? <laughs> so there's a civil part of it that is that really delineates marriage because you could just jump over a broom like they did in the old days and people said you were married. So. It's interesting to note how sometimes we uh, we allow our, ide our ideologies or things that we're exposed to to sort of dissuade us from these things. But it's also, I think, that you know we've also in our country because of the you know the Catholic country is founded on a religious premise, what they used to call the Protestant ethic. Um, it really did a lot to undermine various groups of people, and so for a long time the LGBTQ community stayed hidden underground. You know, they tried to hide if they were. Um, especially, you know, throughout the early and mid 20th century, because you could lose your job or be brutalized. And even up and, you know, to more recently, you know, there's been lots of assaults and attacks on, on the LGBTQ community and uh, physical attacks and people have been killed and harmed who are still, who are human beings. And it's sad to think that we will let our ignorance dictate to us, you know, who we choose to accept and not accept. Um, have we moved the bar forward? Absolutely. But like with all the various movements, we have to make sure that we don't let uh, this this group of people uh, be, you know, get complacent and then let the policies and laws that they, that they have fought for uh, be undermined by policies by those who don't see who who see the world through one lens and not through the lens of the, the variety of groups that make up the, our country. Um, there have been, of course, you know, one of the things that the civil rights protected the the LGBTQ community was through the Civil Rights Act of the interpretation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was said that in regarding employment and things like that, that you couldn't discriminate on the, on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. So this this really set the bar for change, uh, and it's an ongoing change uh, regarding uh, 
you know, as we, as new and uh, uh, new groups come in our society or new ideologies come up, we have to be able to, you know, embrace difference and change and be able to adapt to those who see the world differently than, than, than you may see it. And so uh, I applaud the, the strides that have been made uh, for the LGBTQ community. And, um, and I hope that they will continue and, and keep the fight up so that people will stop to see it through a, through a very narrow lens and uh, understand that, that they are human beings like, like all of us. And uh, so without further ado, I will let you watch these three clips. And then uh, there's a question in the discussion on, on, on these movements. And so I hope that you will get a chance to sort of broaden your mind and, and your perspective on this. Okay. I think I'm, and that's it. Okay, I will look forward to seeing you in chapter four. I hope you guys really got a lot out of this out of this chapter. Um, there's so much more to get to, and I will see you soon. Thanks.